Um, okay, so, because this is the more advanced one, there's no point in doing a kind of a broad overview of role of fulfillment or how to build a case. I imagine you all musically know how to do that. So, what I'll just go through it is just how to do a good first prop, how to make them effective, how to make what seems to be the kind of scariest position in the debate actually be the strongest. Um, so, if you draw a first prop, don't be afraid, you should look at this stands for a BP 15 minute prep or indeed the mace itself, right? So, what I'll go through is, first of all, how to structure the speech, how to structure the speeches, what tactics to use while you're giving the speeches, and secondly, then I'm going to go through the kind of framing power that you get in the first proposition that helps kind of direct the debate towards your view of the world that suits your case this, right? So, what you do, even in the base, even though you have a week to prepare, I, I doubt anybody's going to come up with, you know, more than four excellent arguments. Even if you have a week, haven't done the maze twice, it's really difficult to come up with six really good ones. If you do, well for you, but most of the time you won't. So what you want to do is to fit all of your best material into the first speech, right? This is generally going to be three points. If you can get four really good points and do them well in practice, then go for it, but I suggest to keep it to three, right? So ideally what you what you want to do is from first proposition is to take two POIs. Um, one from the front half and one from the back half. If you only manage to take one, take it from take it from the back half. What this is to do, particularly with reference to the back half, is because you're in first proposition, you don't get to engage directly with the back half teams, or there is at least one speaker between you and the back half teams. You want to see what their material is, so you're not left behind in the base, or that you can rearrange or adapt your case to suit what's coming out of the back half. So what you do with that point of information that you take the back half, that goes into the DPM speech, take that and then try and turn it in to a point, right? Or at least, if not a point, fit what their case is going to be into your existing speech structure. Ideally, you want to have in the DPM speech going into the debate about two and a half or three minutes, or three minutes of your speech prepared. With the Mason, this should be no problem. You should be able to do that. And then the rest needs to be, uh, needs to be particularly responsive, right? Because as the DPM, that is the only chance the first proposition gets to actually engage in the debate. The first proposition, you have seven minutes of substantive material ready to go, and so you want to be able to be as responsive as possible in the DPM speech. That's including to first opposition, obviously, but also to closing opposition. So there's, there's a real danger of like first proposition um, getting left behind, but that's not something that just happens. It's something that usually you haven't been responsive enough. Now, obviously, there will be time where people just ignore you, but if you are responsive, judges will notice that, and will, the other teams will suffer as a result, right? So that's the kind of structure, the way you structurally want to set up your first pop in terms of material delineation and also how you are responsive, right? So let's go through like why if you do a first prop well, you will guarantee yourself to go through around um, to go through the mix, right? Because you just need to come in the top two. First prop is the best position on the table to guarantee yourself at least a second, if not a minute. So how do you do this, right? So you get to set you get to set up the world and frame the debate that best suits you. First part obviously gets power of definition, and you can use that inc to an incre incredibly like benefit your own case, not just simply define what you are objectively talking about or, or think of an objective um, definition to a word in motion or a case, right? So how do you do that? So what you first want to do is to outline what the actual problems of the debate are. Because quite often teams, and this accounts for all positions, will just give solutions without actually identifying what they're trying to solve. If you set out the problems of the debate, what your goals are, so you say we see three problems in the world, three problems in this particular sphere or issue or whatever we're talking about, X, Y, and Z, that gives a point of reference, not only to the entire debate, but also to your case. So you have like three steps, you have the problems, your, your explanation of those problems and causal links, and then your solutions that you give, right? So that's that, that kind of those problems, because they generally won't be undisputed because a definitional challenge is really risky coming out of open opposition, they generally won't be disputed that heavily, so the reference point for the debate can be set up in a way that suits you. So you want to identify what the problems are and then say, these are how these problems are manifest and here's how our solutions fit them best, right? So you select the ones that are important, right? And then comes the, the two aspects of first prop that enable you to really scope the opposition before they've actually got them. Right? So you have, first of all, your, your mechanism that you set up, so like this house would um, X. You're able to exclude arguments 
before they happen. And if not, like obviously the ideal situation is you see the first opposition team crumple up their piece of paper, throw it out, and they get furious and rise in the world, right? Generally, like that, that won't happen. But what will is that they will have a case and they will now have to justify not only why that case attacks yours, but also why it's relevant to the debate or why it matters, right? So I think possibly like a good example of that is a debate that I've, I've seen a couple of times, and it's this house would like grant ownership of, comp of like say the controlling stake of a company to its employee, say 51 percent. Now, having done that bit myself in closing opposition, we simply ran that if you have a small business that employs say 10 people, that the owner the owner of that business loses control. There is no incentives for businesses to actually be started because as soon as you hire one or two people, you're going to you lose the control of the business, right? Strong enough argument. How you can exclude that is you can set a cap on say the number of employees that that business has to have. So you can say, we would only apply this to companies with say 100 employees or more. So that'd be like medium and large scale enterprises, right? So that gets rid of a lot of these, the fodder that opposition can use to attack you. Because opposition can claim, say, the small businesses are what drive the economy, but through your mechanism, you have excluded those, right? And that's reasonable, right? That's quite reasonable to do that, otherwise it's nearly indefensible what you're doing, given that the debate still occurs within the framework of capitalism and that these businesses are still expected to thrive, that you're still expecting to these businesses to, businesses to start. So through that mechanism, you're able to throw a lot of crap over the opposition case, and they will have to jettison the case and make up the move, right? So another way that another way you can do that is again, like that's say a, a very mechanical way of doing things. But say another example for motion is introducing and this is running euros in I can't remember which it was round seven that introducing um, racial arrest quotas for police officers, right? So the, obviously the problem being that, say, in the US, African Americans are arrested in an incredibly disproportionate manner to um, white Americans, and the same can be said for, for Latino Americans. And so what you can do in setting up that, 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 it doesn't seem intuitive, but that case you can add a hell of a lot of clauses to the mechanism that you put in that actually makes opposition's job a lot harder. And these aren't clauses, because I know a lot of, say, models will come with and will include classes on education, right? So that's something that can, the opposition can also do, right? They're, they're kind of weak clauses, they're just really padding their time. But what you can do here is say, so in, we're going to set officers all these quotas depending on their district, and what we will do is offer bonuses if they meet these quotas or penalties on their pay if they fail to meet these quotas, right? That does a number of things. First of all, it's just a really thorough, a thorough workout that explains how your policy will actually work, as opposed to just stating, we will have a quota. What it also does is it also tackles a lot of opposition arguments that will claim, say, that the claim that just police are just simply racist, they won't abide by these quotas. You have granted, like the officers in question, an incentive structure that means more money if you are less racist, less money if you are more racist, right? And that's something because a lot of opposition arguments will be about the institutional racism of police forces around the world. And whilst you might not be able to defeat that with this policy, you have offered a clear incentive for people to actually follow the policy that you have set out. And that incentive is money. And people tend to like having more of that and dislike having less of it, right? So you're able to exclude a lot of op arguments before they, before they actually happen, right? So that's from a, a mechanistic point of view. So always take the chance, take the opportunity in open government to actually expand your mechanism into areas that can tackle the points before they hit them, before they actually come up. And that's actually a lot, the opportunity to do that is a lot more common than you may actually think. So a lot, like a lot of people, given that you have like the mace, you've got a week to prepare, you should be able to do this to an even greater degree. Like analyze what potential opposition arguments could be and then defeat them in the first minute or two minutes of your speech or make them seem less relevant. Like it makes their job a lot more difficult. It also gives you a much greater time to focus on the, the, the first of all, obviously, you have time to focus on the PM speech, but your DPM becomes a lot easier because you get to ridicule opening opposition for bringing irrelevant material and also get to strengthen the case that has been brought beforehand, right? So, any questions on the kind of the mechanistic aspect of first part of that? No? Okay, right. Right, so that's, that's, quite, um, that's quite a blunt tool in order to scope the opposition. Another way, uh, another way to do that is through framing. And this is when there isn't explicitly a mechanism required, or say, it's a beliefs motion, so you can't set out a policy 
that, again, remember, disputing a mechanism is incredibly risky in opposition, so most of the time you have to follow it. So that's a much easier way to do this. But you can also do it in more subtle ways, that whilst op might still challenge, it makes their material still seem less relevant. So what you do is this. So you frame it a bit, and this is, this is more subtle. So you set up your case in a way that suits yours and makes it more difficult for opposition, right? So the example motion here is, this house would introduce um, quotas for the judiciary, right? It's debate, possibly one of the best first stop cases I've ever run. And the way you do that, so like, we've all done quotas debates before, right? And that's the thing, like, thing in debating is you get motions where you can just recycle arguments. So everybody knows the quota argument will put like gender quotas in Parliament, and the response from opposition is, well, this is, this is incredibly tokenistic, first and foremost, and secondly, it's better that we allow organic change. Right? And that is something that is always going to be brought up in those kind of debates, it's, and it's something that generally gains traction in those debates, and is difficult enough to defeat on proposition when you haven't done any extra legwork to try and make it seem less realistic. Right? So, how would you do this, like, in terms of framing the debate? So, what you want to do is make sure what you're talking about, like the, the judiciary, and the policy that you're directing towards this, make it seem unique to that particular problem in a way that that isn't unique to the other scenarios, say gender quotas in parliament or on, cor or on corporate boards, right? So how do you do this? Quite explicitly at the start of your speech, say, the reason this is different to other examples of quotas is, say, the following. So you say, one, the judiciary is incredibly secluded, there is not much um, public scrutiny of judicial appointments, there isn't exactly a way to engage in a grassroots organic change that could, say, get more women elected to parliament, or, say, in a trade union movement within an industry, lobbying for more female representatives more female employees higher up the board, right? So you can't, you can't have that in this instance. Secondly, you say the feeder system for, for the judges, say the way people become barristers or lawyers, are also incredibly secluded. So you have like the Inns of Court in the UK, the King's Inns here, like you know, those lawyer finishing schools in the US, are generally like very secluded, don't like change, generally run by old white men, and there's no way for a grass movements to take place within those particular institutions. And it's those people who go on to form the judiciary. And also, because they're so secluded, it's much more costly for people to say rebel against the status quo that exists in those institutions. So if you want to get ahead, you generally have to toe the line. And you can't say, appeal to the wider masses that this is unfair because nobody knows what's going on inside us. So in that sense, you make very clear at the start that your solutions to this is not, cannot be attacked in the same way that it can be for, say, gender quotas in parliament or corporate boards, right? So that's a way that in first proposition that you can exclude like particularly generic points that can come up from from open government, from from, sorry, from the opposition teams, like including in closing opposition. Like what that does for them, first of all, closing opposition will probably have time to reinvent their case. But opening opposition have then a much higher, like a much much steeper challenge ahead. So a lot of time will be spent in the opening opposition, uh, opening opposition speech on trying to prove the, the, the relevance of their points. And when you have a team not explaining why their points are good and beat yours, but why, first of all, they're relevant to the debate, and then go on to explain why you've beaten them, you put yourself ahead of most of the teams in the debate, right? And now, obviously, I can't guarantee this for everything. Some closing opposition team may come up with something at the time and beat you. There might be a bad judgment call. There might be, you know, something like that. But generally, if you do that, it's something that can guarantee you a second, or guarantee you, in this case, progression through this. Right, are there any kind of questions on kind of first, first proposition? Yeah? So you know it's like a more of a belief notion, and there's no mechanism to implement, and sometimes you feel like you have to define the terms of the debate. Are, are there are debates where you feel like there's just, like, it's just so self-explanatory, there's no mechanism or no definition you can do, or is there always something there is debates where like the, the mechanism is like incredibly self-explanatory. And now I've got kind of workshop syndrome where I can't think of a motion that I haven't written down beforehand. But we'll all have encountered motions where it's say like, this house would legalise all drugs, right? There's mechanisms there that you can tag, that you can tag on, say, you know, we'd have them from, you know, you can only get so much, you can only get this, that, and the other. But that's just mitigating against harms, not really excluding them. So there are there are some debates where won't be able to actually engage in that to the same extent, but when that happens, you can still give an incredibly like first principle proposition case 
that can still do the same effect. So that's, that's an example, say if you, get, if you get a debate where you know nothing about the actual topic, right? And so you're screwed, you're in prep, and you say, like, I have no idea about rare earth mineral extractions in China and its trade relations regarding the US, right? So in that instance, you are still able to, whilst you may not be able to go into the detail that I explained earlier, when you do have some knowledge of the debate, you are able to resort to, resort to say, a first principles case on related issues or issues that might govern this sub-issue that is still incredibly, incredibly powerful. So instead of talking about, say, the complexity of rare earth minimum trade, you could talk about general trade between states and how breaching the, the norms that exist in this particular instance is incredibly detrimental to trade on the whole. Right? So you can run something that is that is first principle, that is like based on really like basic assumptions about the actual wordings in the motions that enable you to still establish an incredibly solid first proposition case. And when you do that, generally your stuff is going to be the, like what is talked about throughout the entire debate. And like so, if you're incredibly solid in the first proposition, closing is going to have to reference you because given that you've laid out the base, they're going to have to reference it in relation to their speech. So you're consistently referenced down the table. So whilst yeah, there are some which you just can't do it, there are bad notions where you, where you are possibly scuppered in first part, it's really difficult. But when you do that, just resort to the basics. Look at, again, like, like, like the gender boys argument, look at things that you, can, that you have done before that can relate to this, that hold true for similar things and relate them back into the, the rare earth of trade in China. So sometimes you can, you can still do things that will enable you yeah, change. Just what you were saying about being reference to other teams, how would you draw the line between scorching the earth for the second pop team and developing the earth for the second as, as first pop? Well, like, ideally you would like to scorch the earth. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's no, don't, don't leave anything. <laughs> don't leave anything for them, right? And that's, that's why, so I, as I laid out in, in DPM, you want to have, um, idea, like, for DPM, and again, it's another, in terms of like, it's a, it's a POI tactic, that's why you only have, say, two and a half or three minutes of your speech ready to go. Ideally, what would happen is that the closing government team give a POI to the only opposition speaker, and you've already taken over the back half in your first speech, so you have an idea of what's going to happen in the back half of the debate, and then you're able to work it in. Now, again, it's like, that takes just practice, it's not something that you can just go in ready to do. Imagine the first time you try, the first time, again, on view, this is your first time, but you, that you try to do that would be quite difficult. But it's almost as almost so like, you know, a double what's what we're looking for. Counter, counter to, to allow them to get the POI in. But then you hear what their, their case is. So that is, that is a good way to, particularly if you haven't got, if you haven't got to score to your material, a way to block something from the back half and use it to your own advantage. So whilst it looks like you're giving POIs, maybe particularly if you're struggling for material, maybe let them go a bit more to enable to get something in. Is there anything else? Yeah. And if you have like a lot of material um, in your first prop, do you think it's better to kind of split it a bit between uh, PM and DPM? Or would you do it kind of like, would you give like the big simpler PM and uh, DPM extend on what you said? No, what you want to do, and this is, this is more true for, listen, no, it's true for DPM and it's true for the maze format, is you really want to have as much as possible in that proposition speech. Because so proposition, well, the prime minister's speech is strong enough as it is because you have seven minutes apart from your POI of, of uninterrupted substantive material, so you don't have to engage in refutation, right? So that means that the opening opposition has, like, the first speaker, has a considerable burden to be responsive, right? So if you fit the most amount into that speech, you increase the burden on them to have to respond. So that gives less of an opportunity for them to get into their substantive case, which means that, like, at the start, they don't have their strong foot forward. It has to wait for the speaker back to really get into the meat of their case. And that just looks weaker. It looks like you are prioritizing proposition material over your own material because you have so much to focus on. Like ideally, you'd want the you want first opposition speaker to have to spend seven minutes on refutation. That would be the ideal result. So they get nothing substantive on the table. They're on the defensive the entire time. So you get to start off in an incredibly strong attack mode, and you force them in to take an incredibly defensive position before they've even said anything. Because if you do a good enough job. Obviously, some of you, you've already excluded some of their stuff in the way you've mecked or framed the debate. So they have to, the first time that they mention their points, are in, in a defensive mode. So they would refute something in your speech and then say, as I would say later in my substantive. So already, they put their own point under attack, and you haven't actually directly attacked the role. 
So you want to get as much material as possible. And then with the mace, that's an easier thing to do because you have a way to prepare. Any other questions? Okay, so we've got some time left. So what I'll, what I'll do briefly is go through the other positions. Again, none of these are offer the same opportunities as first prop does because like definition of power is incredibly potent and unless first prop completely muck it up, you're not gonna get any chance to do that. Right, so in terms of um, opening opposition, I've obviously said that two, it's, it's a difficult, in terms of drawing a line between refutation and substantive, it's quite difficult to know. Obviously, if you get a really big, really good first prop, you're gonna be mostly refu refuting, right? But ideally what you want to have is try to fit the refutation into three minutes. You need to give a substantial part of your speech, but not, not so much that it takes over what your case is. So you really need to lay the groundwork in the next four minutes. So ideally in the mace you want to have, say, two and two. Two points in the first opposition speech and two points in the second. That's the best way to kind of to split that up. Now what you want to do, particularly in opening opposition, is obviously you need to have some practical arms. I find that they are the best way to, to win the debate. But you want to establish yourself as the countering worldview to first proposition. Because when you get up to speak, there is only one view of the world that is on the table, right? So you're the first person to actually counter that. So you've just set up a kind of broad opposite to what that's going to, to what they set up, right? Not necessarily a challenge in the definition of what, like, the definition, because that can lead to pretty bad things, but generally, like, how the world is actually different from what they think, and this is what actually works, right? So, like, like that's, that's, that's what you want to do, because in the back half, you already have a clash of ideals set up, and it's more important that you make your, that you make yourself stand out and seem more relevant, as opposed to like if you can do it, that's great. But as opposed to offering a completely other view of how the world actually works. Right. So that's a, that's particularly important for opening opposition. It's one position that I find like quite difficult. I think it takes the most practice, but it's something with if you kind of follow that rule of thumb, it works out reasonably well most times. Right. And so then briefly um, going on to sorry, any questions on that? It's just like, again, there's not, not as much explanation to go into those, into these positions as others, right? So, for the closing of, and, so for, for so the two extensions, the two extension speeches, what is a serious temptation for most extension speeches, because you've had a top half occur before you, is to really try and lay into the teams that have gone before you, right? Whilst this is admirable, a lot of times people sacrifice that as opposed to the substantive material that they are bringing. Because you're not going to be judged on how well you can already say whip the dead horse or add new lines of reputation into how you beat the top half teams. It's what you bring in your substantive that's going to mark you out. So you're, you're limited in, in your refutation options. It has to be much more focused and much more, much more structured. So you can't do, like opening opposition can engage in the scaffold and refutation and get away with it. That's not really an option for the back half teams. Because one, you're expected to have slightly more nuanced view of what the top half of the bait was, you've had like 28 minutes to do it, but also you have to devote like realistically at least four minutes to actually getting your extension out. So whilst it may be like whilst you may have had time to figure out amazing responses to the small line of small line of analysis that you've heard from your team, it's best to actually try and parse out what's most important and focus on that. Because you you will have to jettison, you will have to not attack some things directly. You can include them, reference them in your substantive material, but, but really focus on the kind of crux of their case and the causal links that they draw. So that, that just takes a bit of self-restraint, but again, you'll see it, it'll be much better for you when you do it, right? So, uh, regarding the... Okay, yeah, and this, so, this is just lastly on the kind of summation speeches in the debate, just how to, how to structure them. Because they can also, they can be Apart from if the first proposition mirrors it, they can be quite messy, right? And so there is, whilst there is no way to tell you the best way to sum a debate, there is a kind of structure that you can follow that does quite well. So it's different for closing, and it's different for, for different for closing goal, different for closing goal. So for closing goal, you want to structure it in the following way. Your first point is not going to be a point of clash. It's going to be like a substantive point, a substantive point of refutation that's focused on the extension that you get from closing opposition, right? Because quite often people will say, I have three points of clash, talk about the debate in its entirety without properly referencing or crediting the material that's come out of closing opposition, right? And this is because you go into that, well, at least I know most people will go into it with a reasonably blank sheet and fill out what they're going to say during the debate. That's something that can quite often 
get left behind because you're furiously writing, trying to fit your partner's speech to fit how it's the most relevant thing in comparison to the top half and forgetting the opposition extension. So ideally you want to have a page blank and listen to the extension speaker and write a point in relation to that, right? That's, in, that's incredibly, ugh, incredibly important for that. For closing, for closing opposition, for the, for the whip there, your partner should have done a reasonable job on refuting the extension. But again, because they have to be incredibly selective and also deal with the opening team, like a lot of, like whip, a lot of uh, back half teams, particularly closing up and get punished for ignoring first proposition, it's rather, whether or not they get the job completely done, I'd say rather most times they're not going to get it done. So again, you want to structure it in a similar fashion. You want to have one point that's a substantive refutation point that's focused more or less exclusively on the government extension and give that, you know, like kind of a minute and a half of your speech to clear up any things that your partner has missed. Unless they've done a really good job, there's going to be something outstanding. It's also going to be buttressed by the fact that the government whip would have supported it in their summation, right? So don't, don't, don't focus purely on the debate as a whole or make sure that, oh, I'm responding to the top half team. Focus on that as well. And again, then structure it in the same way in your two points of clash. Because debates usually only have two points of clash. If it's three, there's probably some repetition in there. It looks like you're trying to fill time, so focus on two. Right. Is there any more questions at this stage? Um, Who's that guy? Huh? <laughs> he's, uh, he's giving the opening opposition masterclass uh, at the end of at the end of this. Um, just in terms of positioning, I thought this this my kind of workshop here is half an hour, not forty. Um, I guess just one thing that you mentioned.
chances are closing government aren't going to bring that up massively again unless they can completely claim ownership of the POI. So there's no adverse consequences or there's lesser adverse consequences to not taking the point of information from opening government because they don't have time to hit you with it later on in the next speech. Yeah, just on that, um, you obviously talked about strategic POIs from opening prop. What would you say for the other three positions? How many POIs would you take? Obviously, oh, I have one, I have one. Just, just opening government can be, particularly if you are in the swing of things. If you are in good form, opening government can take two. But everywhere else, I would just take one. And if I'm okay. from close from, so if I'm closing, you take one from your opening team, right? Because you always want to show in all positions in the debate that you are engaging both teams on your bench. Don't I know it's it's quite easy to like if you're in top half and back half to separate yourself into a battle with your just the team that's opposite with you because you're the ones that you're engaged that you're swapping speeches with. But particularly for closing opposition and closing government, definitely take, I would always take my opening half team. Because what's the point? And even like first of all that shows that you're engaging with the bench, with the bench's judges. But what's the point in giving so if I'm closing government and I'm up extension, what is the point of taking a POI from closing government when they're gonna get up to speak after them anyways? You don't want to give them an added opportunity to hit you. They've got they've already got seven minutes. Don't give them another one. Whereas this team, again, they and they won't have a speaker. Even if you get the POI was bad, they don't have the speech to hit you with afterwards. So from a looking like engaging and also a strategic point of view, I would always take it from your your at least one across the team from your top half opponent. I don't think. Huh? I don't think. Oh, wait. Say again. From as of the up. So yeah, opening up. So opening up first speaker. Yeah. You take a POI from back half. The same, so as, same, as, same, same as OG. Now, like in in the second in the DLO, in the DPM, in the DLO, it's less of a of a hard and fast rule. If um, so, if you know the team is particularly strong opposing you, maybe take it from them to show that you're hitting the best team. But unless you can know that for certain, then just decide. Like that's up to yourself to decide. But definitely in the in the top two. Um, so, I've heard this advice sometimes given to people who are speaking in DLO and, uh, and like teams who are speaking in, opposi in, in opposition. I was wondering what like, you think of it. So, uh, sometimes people get told that they should backload material into the DLO speech and like give like one, maybe one and a half sort of uh, substantive points in the leader of opposition and then leave, leave the rest of it to mostly rebuttal because of, like, first of all, the inherently rebuttal nature of the yeah. opposition and also because. Uh, Opening, opening government and opening up, you need to respond to substantial material before letting DLO in any real sense, except for POIs. Um, I was just wondering like, what do you think of that advice, or do you think that's like being insufficiently like, engaging or whatever? Engaging. Yeah. Um, so th that's one of the reasons why I'm not particularly mental about opening up position, yeah. because of that kind of yeah. right? So I find a good way to kind of get balance is for your opening up position to have, like, one, you have your responsive nature, so you have your three minutes. Three to three and a half minutes of it. And then the point that you have is a, a collection of harms rolled into a substantive yeah. point, right? So you're able to have, say, like, I have a point for you with, with three sub points in a way that this policy adversely affects group X, group Y, or group Z, or how it exacerbates the problem that you're actually talking about, right? So there you have a substantive chunk of material that is, again, offensive material. So you can be accused of not giving something for the the DPM to accuse them. Now it has to be like, obviously you want it to be good and it can't be shielded. But so then you can have more substantive material in the DLO speech. Right? So like, in, just in terms of the timing yeah. fashion, that is just a strategic, yeah. strategic thing to do. Yeah. But you don't want to leave yourself in a position where, because if you spend five minutes on refutation and then give like a one and a half minute substantive point and like your, your minute and a half for your POI, like you're not guilty of not allowing, you know, prop to engage, you're guilty of having no case, um, which is your bigger problem, so you can worry about engagement after that. So you do want to have something in there that is strong, that gives them something to engage with. But again, like, the debate's not finished that, so it's not like doing that in the back half, it's not, a big, it's not as big a faux pas as doing it in the back half, because they still have time to get POIs in, there's a whole other debate to come. So that's, that's why I'd say that the best way to do this, and obviously, that I can't account for every debate. But I'd say as a rule of thumb, that's what you want to do. Have just like, three harms in one substantive point. Yeah, just say, uh, opening up maybe their mission to counterbalance even the harm, like just mediate your information. Scatter, just scatter, yeah. So, what's, what's the best way of trying to like, overcome that first? So, negate your. So yeah, like, instead of like, first 
some crazy reason they said, instead of bringing their own case, just trying to engage them, and you say, okay, I'll take it all down. So, how do you prepare yourself from the back half to the second half? The second half? But like, that's, that's risky for opening opposition to do that because you have a completely, you only have one side of the case. You have your like, mostly reputation that is somewhat kind of bundled into a point and no serious substantive matter. Right? So, in that instance, it just depends on how good your DPM is at defending the case that you've brought. Like, if I try to scatter on it, like to hit as many things as they possibly, as they possibly can, the way for the DPM to approach it is obviously you can't defend everything. Defend what's most important that they face. Because generally, if they do that, they will have like, attacked something that's generally not as important to your case as something else is. And that's difficult when they have, when they have nothing to So if you defend that, they have nothing to fall back on to prove that if some of those have failed, well then at least we have this substantive case that will happen. Right? So attempt to like point out, e even point out that they have given no account for how, like, say, under their metric the status quo will improve. They just try to attack ours and have thus failed in these instances. Like again, that's as good as your reputation, that's something that you have to do, something I can't tell you to do, or can't do for you. Stephen, did you Is that everybody? Okay. Well, I hope that I hope that in terms of like regarding first crop, um, again, it can be the strongest position on the base, particularly like for the for the mace for the weak preparation that is like a serious power up to first proposition. You should be looking to go through your mace your mace rounds if you get first prop. Incredibly powerful position. Remember, try and negate opposition before they actually come up. When people say preemptive rebuttal, that's difficult to. It's proven why it actually doesn't matter. I'm not dealing with substantive. So I hope that's been um, somewhat helpful, if a little bit confused. Um, so, cheers.